So one thing that, that we haven't really discussed or, 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 or broadly addressed is markets change. Um, you know, risk, to have a risk rating at time of issuance, you know, creates, a, you know, is that creating some sort of statement uh, removing the elements of, of market transition? So, Keith, let me ask you, in that regard, you know, how, what kind of potential liability does this introduce into a product? If I'm an investor, I sit here and say, oh, you know, the risk on this is B, I feel good about it, but yet, you know, tomorrow, I, perhaps I put too much faith in that risk ranking, you know, the VIX blows out, you know, to 26, the s and is down 600 bips, I'm coming up to my call date, and now, you know, I don't get a return on my investment. How does that fit into market dynamics? Jim, it's a, it's a great point. Uh, if we talk about one-size-fits-all ratings, uh, there is that risk that uh, we've oversimplified uh, on a quantitative uh, basis. Uh, how the uh, product is supposed to work. So if it doesn't take into account certain markets, uh, market uh, disruption events, uh, you could have had a principal protected note from uh, Lehman Brothers, for example, and that would have gotten probably the most conserved risk rating. And uh, most of those trades blew up. That became a, a big liability for a lot of distributors uh, of those notes. So what happens? Does it take into account credit rating? Does it, and uh, how meaningful is that at the end of the day if the product doesn't perform? As, uh, as the investor was expecting. And yet also, on, uh, as it relates to some of the kid documentation and, and the prospectus, you know, that, how is that going to be used you know, as a retail investor? You know, is this creating documents that I can point to if, I, if the transaction didn't go my way? Could very well be a lightning rod because, again, as we were talking about earlier, the kid documentation is very, uh, has a very limited amount of space to describe a product. So if a product has certain complexities, can you get that all into the kid document? So that, that's one concern. Uh, the other concern would be uh, that when an investor loses money, it's like it's always easy to look over your shoder and say, "Well, you didn't disclose this, you didn't tell me that the uh, FX markets could go this way, or you didn't properly disclose this, uh, and it becomes a lightning rod. What, my reading of some of the uh, proposed uh, infrastructure for prips does suggest that that could become a document that an investor could use uh, and create enhanced liability for the manufacturers that they otherwise wouldn't have. So Tim, let me ask you a question. Um, you know, of the, you've been in this market for years. Um, you know, to the extent of these four options, is there? You know, do you think one of them is going to win out at this point in time? Or let me ask, what is your preference? Uh, you know, in terms of methodology and, and why? Um, it's hard to call, really. I think uh, the, the two quantitative methods, um, which is options two and three on on the list. Uh, are my favourites, uh, and I personally think it's likely to come from one of those two. I think uh, any qualitative method is is fraught with difficulty to, to keep it consistent and wide-ranging enough. So, well, let me ask you one other question in that regard. So, you know, coming back to the market dynamics and, and elements changing, there's also been a lot of questions about the use of projections over the life. Where do you see um, uh, the uh, looking at future potential performance uh, as part of this disclosure, uh, bringing greater transparency and understanding of the products to investors? It, it, that's, that's another question that regulators in UK and the rest of Europe have been grappling with in in the sort of last year or so, I think everyone broadly, or most people broadly, say that investor projections um, are some kind of some kind of uh, understanding of what the product might realistically return um, are a good thing. Um, but the question is how you get there. So if you rely on historical data in some way, that's clearly very dependent on what's actually happened in the past. Um, if you go for forward-looking simulations, projections, which is probably um, a more reliable um, uh, way to go forward, then of course the question is you know, what parameters do you use? Uh, what volatility levels? Um, and also what risk premium, if any, what market uplift? Uh, and it's very important that um, if the industry goes down that road, that if, if two um, distributors bring out identical products on the same day, they've got to be using the same methodology because they should get the same results. Otherwise, you'd have an investor would pick up two brochures of what are essentially identical products uh, and might get misled by the fact that um, the, the two distributors have used different, although perhaps both um, intrinsically reasonable methods on their own, but come up with different numbers. So you know, consistency is, is key in this regard. What it sounds to me is that, that there should be some third party 
not just the manufacturer, but that something like uh, when you go to get a Q-SIP, for example, when you get that from uh, S&P, is there some sort of like separate body where you could go to them? And, and so you have the two different manufacturers with similar products going to the same, uh, you know, getting the same risk rating from a third party. To me, that sounds as if that's, that's uh, something that should be looked into. Well, this, could this be the, finally the catalyst to an active secondary market? You've got many steps in between the secondary market, uh, but that would be one step towards that, I would agree with. So, uh, Keith, uh, one final question, and, uh, and we're going to come to a close. So, Tim, my question for you in just a moment is going to be, what haven't we talked about? What's keeping you up at night? I'll let you think about that for just a second. But, Keith, um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, SEC clearly took a, a leader, leadership uh, as it's uh, compared to its European colleagues on EIV. Yes, but I, you can argue that we're probably two years away from from a version of PRIPS coming to the U.S. What uh, what are the U.S. manufacturers going to be looking at during this time frame, and how are they going to be thinking about preparing? I think at this point in time, uh, Jim, <clears throat> many of the issuers are already grappling right now with enhanced regulation uh, in the wake of uh, the uh, uh, 07 market break. Uh, so uh, there's a lot that they're already uh, dealing with with FINRA. So I don't think they're forward-looking about what's going to happen. It's going to be a wait-and-see approach to see how uh, how it works. But uh, as we know, the European market is uh, far more developed than uh, the U.S. market in terms of the issuance of structured notes and the widespread acceptance uh, among retail investors. I'd say there's probably a three- or four-year uh, lead time that Europe has over the U.S. So uh, we'll get there. I would say uh, probably about two or three years we'll start to see, we'll be, have the opportunity to see how PRIPs have worked in the EU and the uh, SEC uh, typically does try to adopt successful uh, programs that are successful and hopefully discard uh, the parts of it that are not. And arguably we'll start seeing interest rates come back, uh, you know, globally across the board, the, you know, inflation reviews, you know, all, all of those boons that will help facilitate issuance but with better, more transparent products. So that, yep. would, be that would be the goal. And uh, of course, we at the Structured Products Association uh, fully support uh, greater transparency. Uh, hopefully transparency that uh, does not provide complexity uh, to either the investor or the issuer being able to comply with those regulations. So, Tim, back to your nightmares. What's keeping you up? Um, well, I guess the question of how uh, the industry, sort of industry in both the UK, Europe, and the US can, can grow and, and what role our company can play in that in terms of uh, providing risk ratings, projections, cost and estimates, uh, analysis, um, you know, the, the whole thing. Structured products are very interesting uh, asset class and investment classes, I'm sure we all agree. But the thing about them is that they sit in two camps, in my view. Um, on the one hand, they are quite sort of simple uh, um, uh, a contract between a, an issuer and investor. You know, I'm looking for these cash flows, this profile, at a certain point in time. On the other hand, they naturally can lend themselves to some kind of quantitative fund-like analysis, so the risk ratings, um, cost analysis, all that kind of thing as well. Um, it's, it's, clear, it's important that the message stays clear, um, that investors don't get confused by you know, exactly what these products are all about. But if, if the industry as a whole gets that right, then um, it should be possible to, to grow the market and provide solutions for more people than is currently being done. Thank you, Tim. And uh, Keith, any final thoughts? No, I think uh, Tim has uh, done an excellent job in, in describing what's been going on in Europe. Uh, we're taking that wait-and-see approach here in the U.S., and so we'll be watching things very carefully uh, going forward. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for your time today and your insights and thoughts. And, of course, as we get to the August 17th date and we get some more clarity, I would love to have you both back on to be able to discuss kind of where the next steps is as, as we see what options uh, are finally on the table. Thank you so much. I'm your host, Jim Jockle.